Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here at the Guiding Resilient Girls webinar. Um, usually I would say um, welcome, but now I feel like I have to thank you for welcoming me into your um, homes on your devices, uh, whatever you're using to join us here today. Um, it's uh, really exciting to have this talk on this platform. This is my first time doing a webinar, so I'm going to model a little bit of vulnerability here and let you know I'm a little nervous. But I think we're all dealing with a lot of firsts right now, uh, but I'm trying to lean into the excitement um, that comes with firsts as opposed to the fear. So you can help me out there. Um, uh, I, I do feel like I want to virtually extend um, my wishes for your health and safety and for the health and safety of your loved ones at this time. Um, I also want to acknowledge you for what it takes for you to be here right now um, and to be a champion for your own resilience and for, for the resilience in your girls' lives. So. Um, um, thank you for, for all that it took for you to be here. All right, let's get to next slide, please. Awesome. So you'll notice that I, um, you've met Catherine, but there are other some folks behind the scenes, some tech support. So I might be reaching out to people and asking for their help, uh, or you might hear some voices, and that's just the girls' leadership uh, tech crew backing me up. So uh, these are our guiding questions uh, for today's talk. Guiding questions are, what is the relationship between social emotional learning, leadership and bias? And how does that relationship impact girls of color? What is girls leadership's response to our latest research on girls of color and leadership? And what does healing centered, and look, what does healing -centered engagement look like with distance learning? What does healing centered engagement look like with distance learning? Uh, in my role at Girls Leadership, um, I innovate and develop um, uh, Girls Leadership curricula through a culturally responsive and trauma-informed lens. I facilitate both public and private trainings. Um, and at Girls Leadership, our mission is to equip girls with the skills to exercise the power of their voice. We equip girls with the skills to exercise the power of their voice. And when we talk about leadership, I think a lot of the time when we think about leadership, we think of traditional leadership, um, like big L leadership is what we like to say at Girls Leadership. Um, uh, leadership as it relates to titles and hierarchy, like CEO or debate champ. But when we ask girls, how do you define leadership? We heard a lot of things like a leader is someone who brings people together. A leader is someone who uh, follows their own moral compass. A leader is someone who can stand up for people in need, right? And those are social emotional skills. To be able to do that, that requires some, some social emotional skill. Um, and so that's what we do. We provide social emotional learning uh, to girls to support them in their definition of leadership. So social emotional learning, let's start there, the foundation. So uh, this is the castle wheel. Um, it's fairly ubiquitous in the world of CELL. And CASEL is the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning. Uh, and they created this wheel and they asked themselves, what are the five core competencies that someone might need to develop in order to be successful? And this is what they came up with. They came up with self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, social awareness, and self-awareness as these five tenets. And then they, they thought to themselves, how could you measure um, whether these, these skills are being implemented successfully? And they said, well, let's see, if you look at those, um, those circles uh, that lead outward, that first ring is classroom. So they're thinking, great, if kids, kids learn these skills in their classrooms, the hope is that those skills will then be supported by the broader network, their school. And then they'll, the, they'll, they'll take those skills outside of school back to their homes and their communities. Um, and that uh, those skills will really be integrated um, through the whole child's life and through all aspects of their, of their world. What we find though, is that, and we'll get into this a little later, uh, that there's a fracture sometimes between those rings where somehow there's a disconnect between what they're learning in school, what they're learning in their classrooms, and taking that information home to their parents, their siblings, and to their broader community. So something else to note about that castle wheel is that there's room for interrogation. 
Uh, it was created by a white uh, Western dominant culture uh, where they decided those were the five most important things that someone might need to be successful. Uh, I think there's room to interrogate the validity of uh, the importance of all five of those. There may be some that hold um, more importance than others. Um, uh, so uh, while that is the, the foundation of the work that we do, um, we're also aware of the lens through which it was produced. So when we talk about the problem with most cell programs, that's one, just not looking at who created that cell wheel. Um, it's developed the lens of the dominant culture. An example of this is a lot of cell programs um, talk about the importance of a firm handshake and eye contact, which in some settings could be great, a great skill to have in your back pocket. But for a lot of folks and in a lot of cultures, eye contact comes across as disrespectful. And so if a student is learning in their classroom, uh, eye contact is of utmost importance, and then they take that home and they use that with their parents, <laughs> um, and then they're reprimanded for that, well then that goes back to that disconnect between the school, the classroom, and taking, integrating those skills into their home and communities, right? So we have to be culturally responsive when we talk about social emotional learning. This is the bottom line. They do not take trauma into account. Yeah, when we're talking about people's social emotional lives, trauma is bound to show up. It's inevitable. When you work with humans in general, trauma is bound to show up, specifically when you're talking about their social emotional lives. And so we have to be responsive to that. We have to be responsible for what might come up. They do not take power, privilege, or oppression by gender, class, race, et cetera, into account. Um, let's see, an example for this would be um, uh, assertive language, right? Let's say that there's, there's a, script, a, a script for how to, to be assertive. Well, if a black or brown girl uses that same script to be assertive, um, it might be received a lot differently than if um, a white girl were to use that same script to be assertive. Uh, it might come across as defiant or disruptive or aggressive. And so um, we have to be responsive to how people are received based on their identities in this world. They do not provide training or support for adults implementing the programming. Yeah, I mean, I see this all the time in my work hand over a social emotional learning lesson to a math teacher or a science teacher and yeah they're they're eager and they they, they want to do the work but a math teacher can assess if a math class doesn't go well why it may not have gone well but if they do a lesson on social emotional learning and something doesn't land they may be stuck and so we need to provide educators with the skills um, to be able to assess um, why something is or isn't landing and so the impact is SEL programs ask students to comply and assimilate. Students are alienated um, by prescriptive SEL curriculum and student don't, students don't apply these skills. Let's move on to the next slide. So I want to respond to a logistical question first. I saw the question, can you please send us the slides? The answer is yes, we can. Um, but one thing that I do want to let you know is that we do need to replace the research data slides with a summary of what you just heard about the research because it is not yet launched. We are planning to launch it late spring or early summer. And as soon as, you as we have that research, we'll send it to you too so that you have access to it. But the rest of these slides we can absolutely send to you. So this Rowitz leadership scale that was assessing how their leadership uh, aspirations included things like, I have strong convictions about things. When I believe in something, I work to promote it. I have self-confidence. I'm able to say my opinions in public. I like to be in charge of events. When I'm convinced of something, I have courage to act for it. I can speak to persons in authority. I get anxious and excited, and I'm able to use this energy to complete a task. So this is the scale. First thing I notice is this is a highly individualistic representation of leadership. It's very I, me, me, me. And I see 
I have self-confidence. I'm able to say my opinions in public. I like to take charge of events. I have strong convictions about things. These are the things that black and brown students, black and brown girls in particular, get expelled and suspended for. Right? So we're saying that these are the things that we value so much, um, and yet they're often interpreted as defiance and rude and disrespect um, when they're exhibited by black and brown girls. And let's check out the next slide to see how that shows up. So the Department of Ed 2015 report shows that black boys are three times more likely to be suspended than white boys. And that black girls are six times more likely to be suspended than white girls. And they're disciplined for arbitrary reasons like disruption and defiance. Let's go to the next slide, please. So the result is 2% of white girls in their school career experience suspension, 12% of black girls in their school career experience suspension. Wow, that's upsetting, <laughs> that's upsetting. And one study even revealed that some teachers will exercise um, uh, uh, disciplinary measures um, against black and brown girls to encourage them to adopt more passive, uh, acceptable, um, uh, polite kind of qualities of femininity, um, that they would actually use punitive measures because they didn't like how they showed up uh, in terms of their personalities. Let's go to the next slide. We passively reward white and Asian girls for compliance, passiveness, and silence. And Click ahead. We actively punish Black and Latina girls for demonstrating behaviors associated with leadership. We can change this. We can change this. So how do we change it? Well, I change it in the work that I do uh, with Power Lab. So um, I work in partnership with the Young Women's Leadership School network um, and I have a colleague Kim who does the same um, uh, with a network of schools called GALS in Denver and in LA and we go in and we use this process called liberatory design thinking which is that graphic on the right where we start by empathizing we do some deep deep listening to students to teachers guidance counselors administrators what are you noticing what's what is showing up for you as a barrier to leadership what does leadership look like to you we define the problem, we ideate, we prototype, we test, all the while noticing our own biases, reflecting, um, and centering uh, the voices of uh, our students. Um, my students tend to be prim primarily black and brown, so I prioritize um, what's important to them um, in uh, my lessons. And we've created this curriculum that has these six domains. First domain being br brave space, Second domain is mindfulness and self-compassion. Third domain is identity and self-awareness, diversity and social awareness, community and relationship skills, action and advocacy. So these are six domains. And you'll notice that they kind of echo the um, domains in the cell wheel from a little earlier. So you can see the cell wheel is still the foundation, but we've added some, um, we've, 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 we've made it culturally responsive, We've made it trauma-informed. Great. Next slide, please. So that was the process slide. Um, and now the product slide of this um, is that, so not only are we centering the voices of, of girls of color um, in our curriculum, um, but we are making sure that we're coaching educators to not use those very skills against our girls. Right, to kind of interrupt that bias as it shows up um, so that educators are equipped to support girls fully. Uh, the curriculum and the training are designed to meet the needs of girls and interrupt gender bias. Uh, they're culturally responsive and expansive. It's trauma informed. It prioritizes healing centered engagement. It's appropriate to use in multi gender settings. Uh, it's differentiated to meet diverse needs. 
to has a provide the plug and play or sequenced curriculum. So you could use one lesson here, one lesson there. You can split lessons up into like, I just want this to be 20 minutes. I want it to be a full 60 minutes. Um, or it's sequenced curriculum. And that's something that you could come up with your own sequence. We also provide sequences related to like a friendship sequence or a power of voice sequence um, or an action advocacy sequence, uh, as well as ongoing support for adult implementing program and an ongoing community of power collaborators who are constantly giving us feedback on how these lessons are working for them in their spaces with their students. Um, and uh, we're, we're constantly making edits in real time, which is really exciting, always growing. So let's go to the next slide, please. A healing centered approach to teaching during COVID-19. So I want to make sure you're left today with some things that you can um, implement immediately um, to create a healing centered environment um, during distance learning at the moment. Um, so uh, I'm going to provide you with some lessons, activities that you can take with you, as well as some coaching so that you're best prepared to deliver those lessons and facilitate them effectively. Um, these three tenets of healing-centered uh, engagement uh, are from an excellent research uh, resource, uh, Teaching Tolerance, that we will share with you after this training. And these three tenets are a sense of safety, connectedness, and hope. How can, how can we create a sense of safety, connectedness, and hope at this time? If we do those three things, then we're on the tr on track to creating a healing centered environment for ourselves and our students. Let's get started. Next slide, please. Awesome. Sense of safety, name and power of voice. This is one of my favorite activities I'm gonna to introduce to you. It's called a name decoration. And um, <clears throat> I noticed, I mentioned earlier that um, one of the domains in our curriculum is brave space. Um, we're, we're intentional about using the word brave instead of safe because sometimes safety is conflated with no risk or no harm. But when people are talking about their social emotional lives and we're asking them to be vulnerable, there is inherent risk in that. And so instead, we want to encourage them to be brave um, and to champion this idea of being, of being brave. So we have an entire domain with a bunch of lessons on how to create a brave space um, in your classrooms. And this is one of these lessons. So in name decoration, you would invite students to uh, write down their name, the name that they wish to be referred to in that space, and then share a little bit about their name story. So that could be the origin or meaning behind their name, what it was like to grow up with their name, how they feel about their name, or what nicknames they've had, etc. So I'll share mine, a little exemplar. Hopefully you can see it. That's me, Jordan Elizabeth. <laughs> And um, I did my name in a bunch of different colors here because I have a very useless superpower called synesthesia, where I can see letters and color and numbers as color. So J is always purple, O is always black, R is always red. So that's a part of my identity. And then my last name, Elizabeth, it was not a name that I was born with. I was born with the last name per year. Um, but a few years ago when my grandmother passed away, I wanted to find a way to honor her. Um, and so I uh, found out that Elizabeth is a name that goes back in my family for generations. And I thought it would be kind of radical to have a woman's name as my last name and to honor my female lineage. So uh, I said before a judge, changed my last name to Elizabeth. What I love about this exercise and something that was really, I can share a story about how powerful this was. Um, I did this exercise with a group of eighth graders and their teacher was in the room. I was just in to facilitate this lesson and get to know them. And uh, there was a table with two girls. And uh, when it came time for them to share, they were really hesitant. Um, and uh, they kind of shut down. And so I made my way over to the table 
And the teacher said, no, 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 don't worry about it. I'll just do it for them. Their names are this and that. As he went to speak for them. And I had to interrupt him and say, please, please don't do that. I want to make sure that they are speaking their existence into this space and not you. And when I asked them um, what their names were, they said that um, they actually want to be referred to it by a different name. Um, and it seemed like that was the first time um, that either one of them had expressed that in a group and the teacher was shocked. And uh, it was just so great and powerful to see them light up knowing that um, they would be referred to from now on as the names that they had chosen. Um, that, they, that they were bringing their identities into the space in a powerful way. Um, that they had voice and choice in who they were and how people related to them. So it, might, it may feel kind of light, you know, a little name activity, but it can be deep and it can create a sense of safety um, because everyone's sharing um, and uh, because it gives students an opportunity um, to, to, to claim their identities um, and to show up fully. So that's name decoration. Let's go to the next one. Awesome, connectedness. Connectedness and comfort zones. So this is also one of my favorite activities to do with sixth graders. And this activity uh, breeds a sense of connectedness with oneself and then also with others. So it helps um, strengthen that muscle of introspection. And uh, I start by talking to the girls about what is, what are these zones? When you think about your relaxed zone or your comfort zone, think of somewhere you're really comfortable. What does that feel like? How does your body feel? Where are you? Um, are you eating something? Are you with people? Are you watching something? Are you wearing something in particular? How does your body feel? What, what are some emotion words to describe this place? And I say, yeah, the relaxed zone is awesome. It's a great place to be. But sometimes we're, not, we're often not doing a lot of learning in this relaxed zone. Can you think of um, uh, an opera, a time where it would actually be beneficial to be a little bit uncomfortable, to push yourself outside of that relaxed zone? And so then we generate, what are some emotion words? How might your body be feeling in the risk zone? And they generate excitement, um, anxious, uh, a little worried, yeah. And then we, then we talk about reckless zone. And I, I, I am intentional not to ask for suggestions in the reckless zone, because um, I don't want um, that to bring up anything for anyone. But I explain that the reckless zone is where we do feel either emotionally or physically unsafe. And this is where our trauma responses might show up. And our trauma responses are fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. And then I explain to them how they show up in the animal kingdom. Fight, if a, if a shark feels like it's in danger, what does it do? It fights. If the gazelle feels like it's in danger, what does it do? It runs. If a possum feels like it's in danger, what does it do? It freezes, it plays dead, right? Uh, if a dog feels like it's in danger sometimes, it will get on its back in a fawn. Um, so they have an assessment now of what relaxed risk and reckless zones are. And then I ask them to generate some things that might put them in their risk zone. What are some things you can think of that might put you in your risk zone? Um, you could either get, uh, generate some examples from them or you could um, provide exam examples for them, like uh, camping by yourself in the wilderness overnight. Would that put you in your risk zone? Navigating a new city where you don't speak the language, would that put you in your risk zone? Talking about your feelings, et cetera. But the things I hear the most often from sixth graders, the things that put them in their risk zone, um, having to stand up for themselves and their family, um, speaking in front of the class, an exam, a final exam, uh, getting out of the pool wet without a towel and having to walk over to your towel. That's risky. That's risky. And so if I were in a space with them 
I would grab these suggestions out of the hat and ask them to assess for themselves, where do they feel like they live? Is this their risk zone, their relaxed zone, or their reckless zone? And I would organize the room so that the front of the room is the relaxed zone, the back of the room is the reckless zone. And so I read the prompt and they would walk to wherever they felt like that zone lived for them. But in this virtual world, you can do it differently. Relax could be hands on hips. Risk could be hands on heart. Reckless could be hands in the air. Or it could just be a one, a two, and a three. Let's go to the next slide. Hope. So <clears throat> something that I realized almost right away when I started doing that design, liberatory design thinking at, at um, the schools where I work, is that the girls were, uh, many of the girls were living life as if life were just happening to them. And, and, and in many cases, life was just happening to them. And uh, uh, it made me really sad to see um, that they were just living into um, uh, an expectation, living into a this is how it is, that they had no agency over who they were gonna be or what their lives were gonna look like. And so hope is extremely healing. Hope takes people out of um, feeling powerless. And so I created this uh, activity for them to do, to kind of tap into their hope, and it's called hashtag goals. And this is the template, and I will send this all to you at, at the end of this. Uh, and in the wings of this template, I asked them to generate some goals in these arenas, and I give them a timeline. So um, by the end of summer, what are some goals that you'd like um, to reach in the area of your relationship with others, in the area of your relationship with self, school slash work, hobbies slash interests, and they generate them. And then in the center, I asked them to consider what are some ways of being, what are some behaviors that you would have to take on in order to achieve that goal? How would you have to be? So for me, I'll let you model this. Um, that's something that I want, a goal I have for this um, stay at home situation is I want to bake bread. And there's this, there's this recipe for a 10 day Amish bread. <clears throat> I have not been able to commit 10 days uh, until now. <laughs> and so now I want to spend 10 days making this Amish bread. That will be a goal I have for myself. But the quality of being, who I would have to be in order to make that happen is I'd have to be disciplined. I would have to be disciplined and remember to, to do one step each day to make this bread a reality. So then I would put in the center, disciplined. So now girls have a way that's self-inspired <laughs> to realize their goals. That it's less reliant on external circumstances, but more reliant on who can I be to satisfy my own potential. And that's pretty powerful. And it's really great to see themselves light up. Yeah. Oh yes, absolutely. Awesome, let's go to the next slide, please. And now this is the all encompassing slide because we can do all this work on the curriculum, all this work on the lessons, but if the structure isn't in place for these lessons to be successful, then it fails, right? We know that um, the education system is inequitable by design. And so a lot of times when we put all this effort into new initiatives, they fail because um, the, 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 the structures that, uh, that surround them aren't built to see them succeed. And so how can we make sure that we are built to see these initiatives su succeed? And then the first step is with us as educators to check, to check our biases. Let me take a look at this list. When you think about the youth you work with, who do you find the easiest to connect with? 
Who is the most challenging for you? Whose voices do you hear the most often? Which parents do you reach out to the most? Who are your favorites? Who do you send out for discipline? I think especially now, with so much coming up for people um, and for ourselves, it's important for us to check in with who are we, who are we reaching out to? Who are we checking in with? Our bias often shows up in who we decide to help. And we often help people whose identities reflect our own. So take stock of that. Who are you reaching out to right now? Also, who are you adultifying? Who are you saying, they're mature, they got this. They can handle this. They've been through worse. They don't need as much nurturing or attention. Take a look at who you're doing that to, if you are. And also take a look at how, how you are responding to how others are responding. People's trauma responses are showing up right now, whether it's fight, flight, freeze, fawn. And we might be interpreting those behaviors as defiance or disruption, instead of looking at what is the root cause of this behavior? What is the unmet need that perhaps I can meet instead of just trying to squash the behavior? We also know that stress gets in the way <laughs> um, of our being able to um, think critically. So um, take care of yourself. When we're stressed, we're more likely to act on our biases. So take care of yourself during this time, which can feel like an act of defiance to take care of ourselves. I think as women, I think especially as black and brown women who are told that we have to bear the brunt of emotional labor and bear the brunt of physical <laughs> labor sometimes, that it can feel like an act of defiance to put ourselves first. And it is, it's political. But I encourage you to do that so you can model that for your own students. Let's go to the next slide. Next, please. So what? The takeaway. If you see a child for one hour a day, you are 4% of their day. Imagine if for one hour a day, you were made to feel heard, seen, valued, important, challenged, encouraged, and validated by someone you look up to as a mentor. Now imagine the opposite. The impact you have in 4% of a child's day affects how they experience the other 96%. If you're creating a space with this one child where they feel that they can be their full selves, although they can challenge anyone who says that they should do otherwise. What I'm hearing right now from guidance counselors and from teachers and from administrators that there is more disassociation, fatigue, anxiety, confusion, and withdrawal right now among students. We have an opportunity to meet them where they are right now and to put structures in place to help them in the future. Thank you all so much. So um, my hope is that you enjoyed this training <laughs> um, and that you found this presentation helpful. Uh, and if you did, there are two ways that you can support our mission uh, to ensure that girls' leadership makes it through this very financially um, insecure uh, and challenging time. One is by signing up for our Power Collaborative trainings. We have two in April, um, one starting on April 2nd and one starting on April 16th, where you'll have access to the entire curriculum. We'll go through more in depth what it means to be trauma-informed, culturally responsive, healing-centered, talking about our biases. You'll have access to uh, an entire community now of collaborators who are using this work. Um, if you're interested in that, go to 
girlsleadership.org slash PD and sign up. Um, Catherine and I have been working on transforming this training into an online experience and we're really excited about it. You'll get to go through Google Classroom and uh, navigate um, a bunch of discussion boards and materials and video facilitation from us as well as having live in-person um, well, vi video in person, um, opportunities to chat um, with us and with the other participants in the training. And then we also ask that if you um, enjoyed this, <laughs> that you please consider donating to Girls Leadership. Um, and you can do that by going to girlsleadership.org forward slash donate. Thank you all so much for being here. This was fun. <laughs>